This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, and you're listening to Python's Paradise, your film and music show. And this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, back in 1970, two years before my birth, there was a strange little film came out by director Russ Myers, who's, well, his career has been highlighted by strange things, but he made a little film called Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. I love this movie. It's so creative, so cool. And folks, I have the guy who played Emerson Thorne on the phone with me. Uh, welcome, Harrison Page. What an honor. Yeah. Hey, man. Hi, Greg. How you doing? Listen, you, you said Emerson Thorne, and right away I started to get um, chills because I, I'm, I'm, I'm reminiscing a little bit as you're talking. <laughs> about that character and about that film. Um, and when we were we were getting ready to do this film, uh, nobody had any real, uh, you know, any, any real hope for it because it was so, so weird, uh, so eccentric. Um, but um, we, I had done a film with, uh, with, with uh, Russ Meyer called Vixen. Yep. And, and uh, it was an extremely independent film that we did absolutely no money and the way this guy works and, and what he does to tell us a good story because uh, you know you as you well know those, those films were way, basically TNA yeah. uh, but this particular film uh, somehow caught the attention of the entire industry and a lot of that was because he decided that he was going to make some social statements uh, at the same time that he was showing breasts and asses, okay. uh, and so that social statement, uh, you know, I was involved in. So um, I have to say to you uh, that when I started to do that film, I had just gotten out of college, and I had majored in theater arts, and uh, in college, uh, I was considered a pretty damn good actor, but in terms of the profession, you know, I still had that kind of, uh, you know, college approach to to the acting, so it was a little phony as far as I was concerned. But uh, Russ Meyer just absolutely fell in love with my acting. Uh, I, I, you know, he compared me to people who were like big stars, and I thought, what, 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 what's wrong with this person? But the point I'm, I'm trying to make here is, obviously, uh, he had such uh, regard for me uh, after that film. Uh, and the film, Vixen, did very good box office, by the way. Yep. Uh, after that film, he decided he wanted to continue with me and put me in his Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, and uh, uh, it was so it was, it was so surprising to me because he he sent me the script uh, of Beyond the Valley of the Dolls before it was completed, and he wanted to know my opinion, and I kept thinking, my opinion? I'm, I'm just out of college. I'm a kid. I'm I don't know how old I was, but I was a kid, and and I, I had no, absolutely zero experience except fiction of, of, of doing any kind of film. So I was surprised that he was asking my, you know, m you know, asking my opinion of his script. And he said, what the, what what they wanted to do at the at, at Fox at the time is they they wanted him to edit a few things that he did not want to edit. And he said, what do you think? Do you think? I should take this stuff out. And after reading the script, I said, no, don't take anything out because this, this film is basically representative of the kind of films you make. Why would they want you, uh, you know, to do a film for them if they're going to, like, make you be somebody else? It doesn't make any sense. Just do what you do. And he said, you know what? I'm going to tell them that. And I said, yeah, tell them. And he did. He told them. He said, look, you want me to do this film? I'm going to do it my way. If you don't, then we don't do it. And so we end up doing the film the way he wanted to do it. And it turned out pretty good. It was a very successful film. Uh, the character that I played, like I said, Emerson Thorne. Yep. Uh, the name in itself, the name in itself was like struck a strange note to me. It's like Emerson Thorne. What, what, what? Emerson Thorne. It's kind of a superficial thing there. But I said, okay, I want to do this movie. And the movie was... You know, after watching it, I realized that it was it was so uh, uh, so much of an example of 
the time that it told people what the 70s were all about. I mean, it was like an encapsulated uh, kind of uh, uh, display of what the 70s were. And it was there. It was almost even, you know, the Manson situation. I don't know if you know anything about oh, the yeah. Charles yeah. Manson thing. Yeah. But it there was that that in there, too. And then there was the explicit sexuality. There was the drugs. There was the whole thing. And it also had some of a very popular show on television at that time called Laugh-In. Yep. It had that same kind of, you know, kind of cutting, the same kind of uh, uh, fast pace. So it was all there in the film. And at that time, you know, uh, people, industry people saying, well, this is a, this, this movie's, you know, it's a, it's a joke. Uh, uh, and then the movie was released and was a big hit. And people were still kind of saying that was, as a matter of fact, on a personal level, if I said to, I was in Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, I got kind of a snicker. So I went, I, okay, but, you know, hey, uh, it's a film I'm working as an actor. Uh, and so the film, say, years later, I was at Fox Studios, and I think it was around 2006, uh, and somebody was, one of the executives <clears throat> was talking to me, uh, and they mentioned uh, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. And I said, yeah, I did Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. And, and that executive, now this is 2006, is way later after the film, said, that film is a classic. And I said, you got to be joking. I mean, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls is, 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 a, is, is a classic? And they said, yeah, it's a classic, especially for Fox. And I said, you know what? That's right. And so what they were saying earlier made no, no difference whatsoever because the film now is still considered to be a classic, and I'm proud of that. I love the film. I just think it's so bizarre. And even what you were saying about Russ Myers, uh, about the studio, I think they wanted his talent, but they wanted it under their rules. And um, I'm glad that Russ Myers chose to do his own thing because it wouldn't have been true to himself if he didn't. I mean, this is the guy who made Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, which inspired... Exactly right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, and, 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 yeah and, 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 and all those films were, 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 were successful for him, so... Uh, and he should have stayed with it. And you know, it's interesting because he learned a really painful lesson because after Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, and it was a big hit, uh, they gave him another film because he had a three-picture deal because of eviction. He did a film called, uh, I believe it was The Seven Minutes, and it was a courtroom drama. And he did it, obviously, the way they told him to do it or whatever, and the film was a complete flop, and he didn't get his third film. If he had stayed with his own concept of making movies, I think he would have had another hit. But that just goes to show he learned a pretty painful lesson. Yeah, well, you know, what What do the studios know, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I am going to say this, though. I mean, we were talking about Faster Pussycat for a moment there. I mean, there's references to that in Quentin Tarantino's Death Proof. <laughs> Yes, it is. <laughs> yep. yes, it I is. mean, when Kurt Russell's being smacked around, I know where that came from. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and a lot of other films. I remember some films, and I was thinking about it while you were talking, and I forgot the name of it, um, that they used later. I think Mike Myers kind of went in, into that area. Oh, Austin too. Powers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He kind of went into that area that we, we created years ago. Yeah. So, hey, um, you know, obviously it, 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 it struck a note. Even the Phantom of the Paradise had a, a brief little moment, too, uh, uh, inspired by Beyond the Valley of the Doll on, on the, like, a turning bed kind of situation. Yeah. 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 I, I think that Beyond the Valley of the Dolls was absolutely creative. I love creativeness in films, especially when you don't see it so much these days, you know. Um, but um, I gotta say this: uh, one thing that stands out is that Roger Ebert was the screenwriter mm-hmm. of this film. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Roger. Uh, this this thing about Roger Ebert, because Roger Ebert was huge in terms of you know critics. He was just the, one of the top critics, uh, uh, you know, in the business. And he had. I, I was reading a review of Diction. Uh, because he was one of the reasons why Vixen was a big success. 
is that he wrote some of the most incredible reviews of that film and the people in it. I, I, I think it was in the in the Chicago Sun Times that he that he read that he, he wrote that review, and it was like he gave he said uh, things about me that I I didn't even think you know I had. He said stuff like this guy's going to be a movie star, or every kind of thing. And Erica, he said she's you know for for you know for where she came from, she just displays a great deal of talent. All of a sudden, the movie is it really does make fun of sexuality instead of being so serious about it and he just went on and on and on and on and i think that review and all the others that he gave were probably the conduit to his uh relationship with russ meyer because russ then uh you know then looked him up searched him out to to get him to write a script and he did and they wrote it together yeah well, you play, yeah. yeah. You you play Emerson Thorne in the movie, and I'm going to tell you, talk about somebody who has bad luck with women. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 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 oh! This kid. He, you know what? He wasn't my ideal character to play. I, I just felt like he he didn't have any guts i always felt like he just was this awkward kid uh uh who didn't have any fight in him because if it were me today uh or even me in life i never would have made the choice of like letting go of the woman or standing in front of that car like that uh i i, I fought with him about that i said you really you really want me to stand in front of this this car, this fool is driving. You want me to stand in front of it? I mean, what, what, what's, what's the point of that? Why don't I jump in the car and find him? Maybe I'll get beat up, but damn, stand in front of the car. And he said, Yeah, 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 stand in the car because that's that's the idea. So I stood there, but I didn't like it. So I just thought he was he was he was spineless. Yeah, James Englehart uh, played the the boxer, and uh, he was the one that you were competing with uh, yeah. for this woman. And I thought the shot was he with him in the car, where he was like, "Get out of the way!" Get the, some of those shots are just hysterical, you yeah. know? Yeah. Oh, hysterical, hysterical. Well, uh, and he and Engel, the, the character he played was supposedly kind of a, a stand up of Muhammad Ali. Yep. Because he was playing, he kind of looked like him, and he was like, so I. You know, like I said, everything in that film represented that era. So. Yeah, yeah, you got beat up by him a couple of times in the movie. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I mean, I just didn't. I just think this guy had no, this guy had no, uh, no heroics in him whatsoever. I mean, no backbone whatsoever. I would have thought, come on, man, let me let me fight, let me fight, at least let me fight for a while before I get beaten. Uh, but that's not the way it was written. It was written that Emerson Thorne was this, you know, he was this uh, kind of a spineless character. Did you like working with James Englehart? Uh, you know what? I didn't know him very well, so I can't, I can't, uh, uh, you know, I, I can't qualify whether it was I liked him or didn't like him because we didn't talk to each other. Uh, there was no conversation. Okay. He seemed like he seemed like a nice guy, but there was no real, no real exchange of information with him. And of course, um, Marcia McBroom uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> played the woman who was in the midst of all this. And I'm <laughs> kind of like I'm looking at you, saying, "Is she really worth it?" <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, um, she, you know what, um, Marcia McBroom. This was the first thing she'd ever done. Yeah. Uh, and she was so sweet. She was the sweetest lady. Um, and, uh, she, it, it, you know, Russ had her playing this kind of, to a large degree, kind of uh, uh, duplicitous type of, of, uh, of, of person who you, you think she's one thing and she's another. You think she's this really innocent person, uh, but yet and still, you know, this guy comes around and she's dating this, this kid, and they're living in the same apartment, and she's got this guy, this boxer, in bed with her in the same apartment that they're sharing. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm thinking, wow, that's a that's a that's a really mean thing for her 
her to do? You really want? But this is what he did. He this is the way he wrote it. I was like I said before. I wasn't in love with this character, I, I, but I, I, you know, I did the best I could with it at the time, especially with somebody that had very little training. I liked your work in it. I'll, I'll say this, and and I liked her in it, and I liked uh, I liked uh, James in it. I mm-hmm. I thought there was a lot of shots in it that were greatly comedic, like especially the close-ups of James when he's drive getting frustrated in the car. You know, mm-hmm. I I love mm-hmm. those shots. Mhm, mhm, mhm. Yeah, I, well, the whole, you know the, the my the whole cast of people. I you know I formed relationships with those people, and uh, we were all pretty cool together and everything. They were they were all so much younger than me. They were all teenagers. You know, they they John Lazar. I was. Uh, Superwoman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever that thing was. <laughs> Z-Man. Uh, yeah, yeah. There you go. We had a uh, a friendship that that uh, uh, that that grew out of that that work. Um, oh, John. Marcia, yeah. Yeah. Marcia, Marcia and I were friends. I mean, we didn't. We weren't. We weren't intimate with each other. Uh, I don't know. That may have been cool, but we weren't. Um. And then we had basically we had a, we had a lot of people with there was some there was a lady who became later became a really celebrated actor named Pam Greer. Yeah, she was in the film, but you didn't. It was a, like a fast thing right across her, and not you didn't even see her hardly. Uh, but but Pam and I were, were good friends, and I had actually gone to Russ and said, "Why don't you?" Why don't you look at Pam Greer, man? She's she's uh she's really got some some talent there. She's got something going. And he said, "Well, is she a friend of yours?" And I said, "Yeah." And he said, "Okay, I'll take a look at her." And he did. He took a look. As a matter of fact, I think I read with her. Uh, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, she's she's good, but I don't know if if she's right for what I want to say." And I said, "Oh, well, okay, I understand that." I said, "But I just wanted you to take a look at her." Uh, and uh, you know. Had she been in that film, I don't know one way or the other how that would have worked out career-wise, but uh, I think it would have it would have given us given us the picture of something else. Who knows? Okay. But yeah, she was in it. She was in it. Nobody realizes that she was in it because it's so fast. It was right across her. You don't even see her. Quentin Tarantino got good use out of her and Jackie Brown. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I talked to Pam just before she did. That she started to work with uh, Tarantino. We talked, and she told me that Tarantino was interested in her. And I said, "That's fantastic." And we had this conversation about, you know, whether she should do it or whether she doesn't do it. More. And the consensus was that you, know, you go work with Tarantino. He's good. He's good. So what came out of that was this terrific performance where she was nominated for an Oscar. So one of my favorites in the film was Dolly Reed Martin as Kelly. I love those eyes, that red hair, that beautiful complexion. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, she's, you know, Dolly's a, a beautiful girl. Well, she was a beautiful girl. She's now a beautiful woman. Um, but, but he, what, what, what Russ had that was extremely powerful for him was he had the ability to really put that camera in a place that made everybody look their absolute best. Uh, everyone, you know, had these incredibly extreme close-ups. Eyes, uh, eyes, 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 nose, body. Yeah. Everybody had these things that, that accentuated who they were on the screen. And that's one thing that he, that was a strength of his, uh, of being able to take good photographs because he was a, a photographer. Uh, uh, before he started making films, he was, as a matter of fact, he was a war uh, uh, photographer, uh, a World War II photographer. That that he he kind of turned that into a movie making career. I don't know if you know that or not, but I don't think I did. No. No. Yeah, he was a war photographer. Yeah. No, I love Dolly, Dolly Reed. I know um, she was one of the people I know I reached out to uh, for an interview on here, but uh, with Facebook, I find in- interesting. Either people see your message, or I notice with sometimes, and, I've, and this has been a thing with me in the past, is sometimes uh, messages will go into some kind of 
filtered area where they don't see it. And I remember when I, I, I interviewed Jenny Wright from Pink Floyd The Wall, she, uh, yeah, she told me she wasn't getting my messages, and she eventually got uh, connected with me, and we had a great interview, but I discovered my messages weren't getting to her, so I don't know whether that's the case with Dolly or not, but. Yeah. 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 But, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't talked to Dolly in quite some time. I don't know uh, what the situation is with her one way or the other. I know that she's very independent. She's also very private. So it could be that, you know, that she either didn't get your message or, you know, she, like I said, she's a very private person. Well, I'll keep trying. Eventually, maybe, you know. But you mentioned earlier um, John Lazar. Now, what a bizarre performance. It's kind of like pre-Tim Curry and Rocky Horror Picture Show where he's playing right. this bizarre character. And, boy, he's so good, especially when he's going nuts. Yeah, he is. He's very, he's very good in it. Uh, strong, very strong actor. This man was. Don't know why his career didn't take off. I don't. Maybe it was because everybody identified him with the Z-Man character. I don't know. Um, but it should have taken off from there. Uh, 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 I, I thought he actually was the film. He, I mean, he kind of stole it. Yeah. Uh, with that work. Um, I, you know, like I said, I don't know why he didn't go on with with his work, I, but I thought that performance was uh, was stellar. I agree. And of course, you had Dolly Reed, and you had Marsha McBroom, and of course, Cynthia Myers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I love that song they're singing at the beginning of the film. It, it's such, and all these images that are thrown together, and uh, mm-hmm. very, very seventies and sixties. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was that Candyman? Is Candyman thing? Um, I'm wondering if that was Candyman. I don't know if that was it. I don't think it was that. Oh, okay. Um, the okay. opening song where they're singing. Um, I think Candy. Yeah. I think Candyman was in the middle when the guy. Okay. Yeah. It's it, it's been a long time. I don't remember, so I can't help you there. Yeah, I'm trying to think what it was, and it, it escapes me at the moment. Um, I think Candyman might have been in the middle when the, the when the manager uh, tries to commit suicide. I think. Don't, don't quote okay. me on that. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. I could be. I could be wrong. Um, it's been a little while since I've watched the film. Had a beautiful yeah. uh, Criterion Blu-ray release, though. So. Oh, you did. Okay. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, they they do a great job in the films, and I I found that, and I I bought it. I had to grab it. Some great yeah, material. of course, of course. Yeah, that's history, man. Yeah, but other interesting people in it as well, like uh, Michael Blodgett as Lance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, he has a, a, a exp- <laughs> head rolling experience in the film. Yes, yes, he does head, head rolling. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. I didn't look Blodgett. There was a thing with all of us on this show like I said these people were very young you know I was like a little older you know I was like you know 27 or something like that these people were like teenagers mm-hmm. uh, we weren't we weren't uh, close because of course it was a generation thing uh, Michael Blodgett uh, was certainly right for that part um, and he did I think a great job for it these people have gone now, you know, Michael's gone, Cynthia Meyer's gone, um, uh, you know, a lot of these folks are, have gone on, but, uh, uh, you know, they were they were good in their parts, and I wish I could talk about them on a personal basis, but I, I, don't, I didn't know them uh, well enough to, to talk about them. Yeah, well, they, they did a great job in the movie. Yeah, Michael, Michael is gone, and uh, um, it's, it's unfortunate because he... he he was. Um, I'm trying to think who he reminded me of. I think I might even go back to Phantom of the Paradise since they had a little bit of uh, Paul Williams in them. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, Erica Gavin. Of course, you worked with in Vixen, and she is right. in this too as Roxanne. Yeah, yes, she was terrific. Um, uh, and, and I believe because I had a talk with Russ. Russ always was. was for some reason or another, he, he always confided in me. I don't, I st- again, I don't understand that, but um, he, he was saying, I wanted, want Erica to play this, this part of this 
lesbian. And I said, uh, I said, oh yeah, yeah, that's you know, that's good, that's good. But when he saw her, he, he said, you know, she doesn't look the same anymore. I said, well, what, what are you talking about? And he said, he said, well, she's lost weight. She looks really thin. I said, well, that's that's actually that's good because you, you said you wanted to play a lesbian. You know, lesbians don't tend to be very kind of bucks me like that. Um, although, you know, I'm not saying that's not the case because. Believe me, I'm not trying to uh, pinhole whether a lesbian looks like anything or any, anybody, for that matter. Sure. They look like anybody, and they look like everybody. Yeah. Um, uh, but at that particular time, that whole kind of sexual thing was different. And he had this thing, this photo in his mind about how she should look. He wasn't happy about the way she looked. So I said, well, look, you know, hey, man, she, you know, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if she's good, if you like her. And I said, I always told him, I said, don't, don't break up the team, man, because, because <laughs> obviously, you know, it's a winning team. You know, it's you, you know, don't, don't mess up here, don't do that. And I don't know why he again. I would give him advice, and he would go, okay. <laughs> I still have to laugh at that. This guy was like this, you know, monumental filmmaker of of uh, X-rated films at that time and he was asking me for advice it was interesting so anyway uh you know erica uh, and i actually have known each other since the film and we, we talked together as a matter of fact we all her myself and cynthia and dolly we all did a commentary on beyond the valley of the dolls and i don't know i never saw it uh it was supposedly attached to the release of the DVD, I don't know whether it was or it wasn't, uh, but we did it. We went to a studio and we we did a whole thing on it. We did a whole commentary on the film, um, and so I have seen those people over the years. Uh, uh, but again, like I, I haven't spent a whole lot of time with them. Yeah, I, I Cynthia, I, Cynthia Meyer, Cynthia, Cynthia was, uh, uh, you know, around, you know. Uh, at that time, I saw her a lot more than I saw anybody else, and she was a uh, uh, very sweet, sweet, sweet lady. And she had been at one point married to Michael Blodgett. Oh. And oh yeah, yeah, they had gotten married. Okay. And I, actually, when I saw her again after that, I said, "Why did you do that?" And she said, "She said I was in love." And I said, "You skipped over me for him." <laughs> and I and she, and she laughed, and I said. I said, no, it's great. You're 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 in love, and so that marriage broke up. So, uh, oh, yeah, it's unfortunate. I know there's <laughs> some interesting supplementary material on the Criterion disc, and I believe there is uh, a commentary or two on it. Maybe that one's on there. It could be. It could be. It, it could, could be. be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, and I know we did one that we did it, and we must have worked on that thing for about two hours. So I'm sure it's. I'm sure it's there. Yeah. You know, I have not seen Vixen yet. I've got to see Vixen. So I want to know um, from the translation between you and uh, Erica Gavin from that film to uh, to Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, is there any similarities between your characters? Uh, no, no. The, you, when, you see, when you see Vixen, you will understand, I believe, you will understand why Russ Meyer uh, hired me to play Emerson Thorne because um, uh, that guy, um, I think his name was Niles. Yep, and I got that listed here. Yep, Niles, yep. Yeah. Uh, N Niles was a fighter, man. Niles was, he was a rebel, and you didn't want to mess with him. Um and so you will see, in if you watch Vixen, that that both myself and Erica are completely different than we than they were. Well, no, I don't know if Erica was that much different, but my character is it's like uh, uh, it's it's completely opposite uh, in, in Vixen uh, uh, than that of the character in, in Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. The look is basically the same; it's the same guy, but yeah. the character. It's totally different because Niles would not have, Niles would not have stood in front of that car. 
No. <laughs> no. Niles, Niles would not have uh, been knocked down with one punch. No. <laughs> and no, Niles would have done something to win that fight. So why, you have to watch the movie to get that. Uh, yeah, I got I got to see it. I got to find some way to see it because we don't have video yeah. stores here anymore. So, and um, yeah. I don't even remember when the first time I saw Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, but uh, oh. I did catch that somewhere. But Vixen is something I got to see, and um, I I just curious with Erica Gavin and even the other girls, um, were they ever nervous? Like these were X-rated films, so were they nervous about the nudity they had to perform? I I don't think so i don't i don't think so they knew in the very beginning what it was what it was i mean everybody you know we're talking about movie making here and everybody wants to be a front of the camera mm-hmm. everybody wants to be a movie star that's just the way that is um i don't believe any of them and i met all of them before the shoot because they all came in to read i think everybody but dolly reed came in to read okay uh, um and I met them, and they, they didn't seem to have any issue with nudity. As a matter of fact, Cynthia would not have had any issue because she was a, uh, she was a playmate. Yep. Posed yeah. nude. Um, Dolly, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought, would have had any issue because she posed nude. Um, <clears throat> Marsha, of course, didn't come from Playboy, uh, but I didn't get the feeling that she had any issues with it at all either. So I don't think there was any nervousness about, about it. Yeah, it, it struck a curiosity with me as uh, as I watched the film last. And of course, uh, Phyllis Davis, of course, played Susan Lake in the film. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know Phyllis that well either because I don't think we had any scenes together, so I didn't know her very well. I do know that she went on to do other stuff. You know, she did some good television stuff and and uh, was very good, as a matter of fact. Uh, but I, I, her, again, that's another person I wasn't that close to well there there's a, I know there was um a, a veteran actor that's n- no longer with us anymore that was in it. Charles Napier was in this film of course yeah, he has yeah. been in so many films and he was so young in this film here yeah yeah he he worked for Russ many times but he he went into having what they to having a what what they call quote unquote a legitimate career in motion pictures he did a I think the, the the return of the seven or something or another, and he did all kinds of different uh, films and television shows. A character actor, very good, very good actor. Very underrated too, because he yeah. he always stands out. Like he was in the Blues Brothers as a good old boy, you know, and okay. and Silence okay. of the Lambs, and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then yeah. you yeah, and it was just cool to see him in. Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, and of course another funny m- role in this movie, Duncan McLeod as Porter Hall, very yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very funny. The scheming guy. Yeah, yeah, I knew him uh, away from away from the film. I we we played the, played tennis together. Um, uh, he's he's a he's a very interesting guy. Yep, I got. I got to tell you, the the music of the film. Like I said, this came out in 1970, so it has kind of almost kind of a Woodstockish kind of appeal, and ha- the music and the images, mm-hmm. like beautiful, flashy colors, mm-hmm. all throughout mm-hmm. the film. Uh, it's mm-hmm. just gorgeous to look at. Yeah, it is. It's very. He was well. He was good at that. He was good at lighting. He was good at photographing people. Like I said, photographing them to look their very best. He was very interested in and set design colors and so on and so forth and uh you know that was his thing that's why i said he should have stuck with that i agree now since i have not seen vixen yet and i plan i, I gotta see it did, did he do this did he have the same kind of style with that film as well with the colors and the music and whatnot well the style was similar he had with vixen he didn't have enough crew enough money to uh, uh, you know, to create the kind of scenic design that he wanted in Vixen. Okay. When he did Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, he had the money to, to do all that stuff. So he, he would have, I would imagine, had he had that budget, have done some of the same stuff with Vixen, I would, have, I would imagine. But he did, the thing about him, 
uh, which was I found to be really interesting, was that he did everything. In other words, he did everything. He held the camera. Uh, he adjusted the lighting. Uh, a lot of that invention is because there was no, there was no budget, but he still had the know-how to, you know, design the set, shoot the footage, direct the film, uh, deal with the lighting, everything, all of that himself. And uh, before it to come out or turn out the way it did, it, it in itself, I believe, kind of magical. Yep. Now, did I mention Edie Williams as Ashley yet? No, you didn't. Okay, yeah, I was looking over the li list. Yeah, mm -hmm. she was another one that uh, stood out in the film, kind of inserted herself with the uh, with uh, the manager like guy. Sexuality, sexuality, and sexuality. Yeah, yeah. She, she well, she was good at that. She did that. You know, she walked the red carpet uh, uh, a lot in the '60s and '70s and '80s. Uh, she was a a, a staple uh, when there was a, a, a premiere of a film. She was always there with some scanty things she had on uh, and she got a lot of notoriety from that and because of that uh, you know he hired her to play basically what she played most of the time in life and she would I, you know I thought she did a good job of she's it. priceless um, yeah she, she um, it's interesting to, to know about to, to note about her is that all that kind of freedom with sexuality uh, and able to, uh, you know, able to uh, to publicly display herself uh, was is is not like that in life. Uh, she's uh, also very private and also someone who uh, has a, a really terrific humanity to her. I I knew her off the set, uh, and she, uh, her and I talked a lot. And uh, she was always saying that she wished that she had been taken more seriously as an actor. And the discussion was always, well, Edie, if, if you want them to take you seriously as an actor, then you've got to do a serious part. You've got to stop. You've you got, you got this image. It's, it's kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, of, of uh, you know, a, a, a kind of funny, kind of jokey thing that you do with sexuality. It, it almost is like you're you're thumbing your nose at everybody. So look at this, look at this, or you're not going to get it. Kind of teasing thing. I said, this is what pe pe people see you as. If you want to do serious stuff, then you got to turn the corner and do serious stuff, and then people take it serious. And she wanted to do it. But she wanted to do that so badly. We had this long conversation about that. She said, I'm nothing like that. I said, but then you create, you created it. You're the one that, you did that on your own. Nobody made you do that. She said, but I wanted people to notice. And I said, well, okay, now they notice. Now what are you going to do? And, and, and she, she was not like that at all. She was a really nice lady who was very serious about being an actor and being on the screen. And she later married Russ. I don't know if you know that or not. I actually did not know that. Well, he's got good taste. Yeah, he well, in every way. Yeah. Um, she's a very lovely woman at that time. I haven't seen her in years, so I don't know what she looks like now. But uh, uh, he was he was a he was a tough guy on women. He wasn't he wasn't he wasn't uh, very compassionate about them. I wish he had been. I don't know what that was all about because I can't describe it because I don't know what that was all about. No, no. Yeah, you know, she was uh, definitely a standout in the movie, and um, and definitely added something to it. Yeah, there's a number of these people I I know, but this is one thing I loved here is uh, I'm I'm so glad that I was able to reach out to you because there's some of these people that are available in terms of web pages and stuff. You know, it's just a, mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. So I've been able to reach out. It's just a matter of uh, response, but. Um, but a lot of interesting people in that. But you went on to do a few other films too in television. I know it's a film that I had never heard of until I was t looking at your credits. A film called Trouble Man. Don't know what that is, but it says, it says you played a bogus cop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, um, that was a very uh, you know quick thing. But I was playing a, 
um, a character uh, who was basically a, a hood, a, a kind of a uh, hitman, and uh, he he was in this uniform to disguise of what he was what he was about to do. And uh, that, that film starred Robert Hooks. I think there was a lot of other people in that. That was a long time ago, also. Not much to say about it, except I had this little little part playing this bogus cop. Well, you did get to work with Jean-Claude Van Damme and Lionheart. Yeah. Did you see that film? That one I have not seen. I have not seen I'm, I was never a big Van Damme uh, fan. Right, so w- right. when I, I – and it's nothing against him. Um, I love an action movie if the action motivates the story uh, – forward as opposed to just action for the sake of action. And I'll give you an yeah. example. Haywire, I thought, was a terrific action movie with Gina Carano because it keeps moving forward. It's not just mm-hmm. stopping to show a fight scene. It yeah. keeps moving forward. Even Rogue One, the new Star Wars movie, I, mm-hmm. I was surprised how well it, it kept moving forward. And sometimes mm-hmm. I think, and, and this, I'm not trying to insult Van Damme, but sometimes I think he gets into one of these fight scenes and it just becomes a, a fight for the sake of a fight, and they sensationalize mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And But mm-hmm. I know it's one of those films that uh, that he was noted for, and uh, you were in this film with him. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, for you to talk about that film, you got to see it. Because I think you'll be pleasantly surprised in terms of a film moving forward, and I think you'll be surprised at what that film tends to be about. The reason why it's one of his best is because it does move forward. Okay. And because it's not just about the fights; they, they mean something. So, so, so watch it, and then hey, you know, maybe we can talk again. Okay. Yeah. You know, sure. What, okay. what what was your part like in the film? You play a character named Joshua in the film. I do know that. Well, I play a. It's a guy who's a. He's more of a uh, of a of a con man than anything else. He's on the street, uh, and uh, he, he he picks up Jean Claude while Jean Claude is doing this fight. He's trying to make some money, uh, and uh, this guy, uh, uh, you know, forces himself on his, on that on his character and becomes his manager. Okay. And he's got some connections with the underworld people and. He's trying tries to, to set up these fights for him in order for him to make some money to do this thing with his brother's wife. So see the see the movie, and then we can discuss it because it's hard for me to discuss it with you because you don't you haven't seen it. Yeah, um, no, you that, know, he, that, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. Did you, 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 you like working with Van Dam? Well, for my, you know, for my part in that thing, uh, what is. M- what stands out for me was the relationship between those two guys. Okay. And and that that relationship uh, is what the movie becomes. So I'm I ain't gonna say a whole lot about it because you don't you haven't seen it. You, you, I'd have to explain the entire story to you. Yeah, you you don't want to give spoilers. I I agree. Nah. Yeah. See the movie. Then you go and when it, when it's over, call me back. I say okay. Now let's talk about that. Oh, okay. No, that, that's fair. I, I, I had it down here because I know it was one of your notable films. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, sh- sure, you know, maybe I c- might end up liking that one. You know, you, you yeah. could have a point. Yeah. You, know? you never know. I've seen, I, I remember uh, in the course of this journey in the business, uh, there were films like, I hear the title of it, uh, and it's something I said, ah. Uh, I don't want to see this. I don't want to see that movie. And maybe it's about something that I don't care about. Um, there's a film called, uh, it's called Best Years of Our Lives, and it's about World War II and these guys coming home. And so I said, ah, you know, years ago, years ago, I said, I don't want to see that. You know, I don't want to see that. Plus, nobody in there I could recognize. Nobody in there resembles me. So I, I said, ah, I put it off. Then I, by accident, saw it on TV one night, and and couldn't couldn't take my eyes off of that film. And that film was was made by and directed by William Wyler. Okay. And it it was it was it knocked me out. 
because it said something to me that it spoke to me about just not just coming home but it's about life and relationships so you never know until you see it whether you're going to like it or not you you're 100 percent right i know i've been let down by a few more than a few van damme films before but mm-hmm. you know i don't know if that's so much his fault or whether it's just the screenwriter you know i mean uh, he's obviously got great physical capabilities right yeah, you know, but I could say the same thing about Steven Seagal or any of those guys, you know. So yes, I understand. I understand. Yeah, I understand. yeah, yeah. But uh, you're also in a bizarre little movie called uh, uh, Car- Carnosaur. Oh yeah, yeah, Carnosaur. I am in that, aren't I? Um, <laughs> a little Jurassic Park action, huh? Yeah, a little, little, uh, a little. Um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, not not quite up to Jurassic Park, um, <laughs> but but uh, you know you don't know what people are going to do in editing. You don't know what people are going to do in terms of special effects. There's there's everybody else. Everybody when you do a film, it's collaborative. But when you when you finish with it, you don't know what's going to happen. You know you get editors, you get special effects, you get all kinds of stuff that you had nothing to do with. And all I could do in Connoisseur is appear in the film do the best I can with what I had. And after that, it's up to everybody else. And when I saw the film itself, I said, oh my God, they, I thought I was going to be, you know, looking at something that looked like, a, a, you know, a, a um, Tyrannosaurus uh, like the ones in Jurassic Park. But what I was looking at was something totally different <laughs> when it was on the screen yeah. and I was extremely disappointed with what those guys did and uh, I'm, I'm, you know it's like ah, well that's what they did you know what I did was I, I, I you know I had this this thing where I'm going I'm shooting that thing and I'm, I'm looking way up in, in the air looking at it and it turns out the thing ain't that big so uh, you know you, you can only do what you do I mean as an actor I did what I did and that's it yeah uh, what you guys say I didn't say anything. Oh, okay. I thought you was adding something to that. No. Maybe, maybe it was kind of maybe maybe they're playing it as kind of one of these um, attack of the killer tomatoes type thing. I I don't know. You know. Yeah, could have been. Could have been. I don't know. That wasn't the concept that I understood. I understood no. it was going to be, you know, understood it was going to be about this monstrosity uh, of an animal. And it, I don't know what they did. Like I said, I'm not responsible for what they did. I'm only responsible for my appearance on the screen and that's it and the last film I want to bring up of course is Badass yeah Badass Badass I, I don't I didn't, did you see it that one I have not seen no okay you haven't seen that one either no okay but uh, I understand you had a great cast you were working with I actually had not heard of Badass I don't think that was even released here um, it, I, may not have, it may not have been I think it went straight to video okay I believe yeah um no, that was that was good. I had a um, you know nice role playing a friend of Danny Trejo. Yeah, and uh, uh, and uh, we I, I personally believe the film would have been better had I not been killed. But then that's my own personal feeling. Uh, but I'm killed in the film, and that's the reason why he goes and starts doing a whole lot of things because his best friend has been killed by these people. So you know the, the point of the film was that I do get killed. And he goes out and starts fighting uh, these folks that did it. So, you know, I, I would have liked it if I I stayed alive. <laughs> but then that's me. That's that's the actor talking. You know, well, I think well, they did sequels after that. So, well, Danny Trejo, like after Machete, I'm so glad with Machete he got a lead role because he was always in the background, and it's so yeah. cool to see him finally get a break. And we see he's actually a pretty cool uh, screen presence. Yes, he is. He is, and. Uh, a, a good guy too. I I, I I was surprised at at how good of a guy he was because he he spent most of his life in and out of prison. So um, for him uh, to be the kind of person that he was, and he he's always I think he's, he spent most of his life trying to keep people from doing things that would would get them locked up. Wow! Uh, and so he puts a lot of time in that. Uh, that, that kind of thing, and, and he, as a matter of fact, I had to talk with him about that. He said, 
that he promised himself, and I think some other people, that he would now try to steer people clear of, of criminal behavior. So that's that's commendable, right? Yes, that's very commendable. I think he was interviewed by Howard Stern, and he was talking about um, that very, very thing. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And I know I didn't. I know there was a film that you did. You did. You worked with William Cat in a film too, didn't you? Bill Cat. I was in a something. Yeah, that was a. Oh, I can't. And I don't have it written down here. Yeah, uh, I forgot the name of that thing. I forgot. Um, geez, I can't come up with it right now. Yeah, I did. I didn't have any scenes with him, but I, I did. I, I did a film. I remember him as the greatest American hero when I was young. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember him as the greatest American hero also. I wasn't that young, but I remember him in that. Yeah. Well, tell me, uh, like, what are you doing now? You got, like, any, like, web pages and, and charities or whatnot that you're involved with? Well, I, I have a website. Uh, I am going to be constructing something where that's interactive. The one that I got up is not, it's just pages. It's not interactive. Um, I don't know when I'm going to do that. I also wrote a film that I really want to get produced. Okay. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know. We already have uh, a guy I want to shoot it. I don't know if that's going to work out. It's in that stage where I don't know where it's going to go. And I, all I can do is just keep trying to get it done. It's it's a wonderful film, and it takes place in a small southern town, and it, it's right up my alley because I was born in a small southern town. So uh, we'll see what happens with, it, with that. <clears throat> I also... I also teach. <coughs> excuse me. I also teach acting. Okay. Uh, I, I, you know, and and try to, uh, you know, inform young people about the the acting profession and how to go about getting a job and that sort, of, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. 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 Um, I gotta say, I, I I I wish you luck on the movie. Like I'm, I know you're not. I know you're not going to talk about the details of it on here right now. But right, that that'd be something I'd be definitely interested to engage with you about uh, um, when it is done. Um, when when did you start that project? Like how long have you been doing that? Well, um, I have done. I I I would give. I would venture to say. That it's, a, it's that ten years of writing and rewriting, and then throwing everything out and starting all over. I, I, you know that kind of thing. Um, but in terms of, of the, lately, I would say the last couple of years, I really sat down and came up with a concept that I'm I'm happy with, and a few other people were happy with. So um, it's. It's actually a screenplay that's finished, but needs to be produced now. Are, are so you I, gonna started, st I started it way, way back. Are you going to star in it? Yeah, I am. I am. And and one of the one of the the the, the hurdles that I have to jump is age. Oh. And when I started writing this thing, I was you know in my you know fifties, you know early. 60s, whatever, um, and I was I was absolutely right for it right then. I was right for it. You know, middle age. I was right for it. Um, I don't believe that age has a whole lot to do. This is my own personal thing. Okay. I don't believe age has a whole lot to do with storytelling. And if, if you want to tell a story. And you say the character is an older guy or an older woman, or like, like for instance, just throwing out there, James Cromwell, okay. who I know very well and who is a fabulous actor. I don't think his work uh, is based upon anything having to do with his age. He is an older guy, but he, you know, it doesn't I curtail or interrupt or, or hurt anything that he does as an actor. Nope. He could play anything still. Yep. Um, and he and I are around the same age. So I think I think uh, when we start to, um, uh, you know, come up with these limitations uh, in terms of people's work, it's ridiculous. Like Jane Fonda is still working. Oh, yeah, love Jane. 
you know, uh, still working. And she's still working. She's one of those people who is an advocate for uh, older women working. Um, I agree, yep. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm like that, too. It's like if, if I, as long as I can stand up and look pretty good, uh, I should be able to play anything I want to play. So I, what I did when I wrote this thing was every time I went back to, to it and I got a little older, I made sure that that character is around my age and that what he does and his, his behavior in the film reflects that. I even have in it that somebody says to him that, you know, you need to, you need to retire or, and, or there's, there's words in it saying that you're, um, you're, you know, you're too old for, for what you're doing. Um, and I, I want that there because what that does is that it, it really frees the person who's watching it from, from thinking that, uh, and, 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 and being distracted by it because I put it in. I always put it in so that everybody says, so that we, that we don't look like we're trying to, to escape how old I am. You know, I can go back to actors working as leading men back in the day, like Cary Grant, and, he, and they, were, they were older people still playing leading parts, yep. playing love interests. Yep. So, you know, it, it, you know, the only thing, the only difference today is None of us actors can escape how old we are because our age is right there on the Internet, all over the place. And we've been trying to get the IMDB. I don't know if you know what that is. It's yep. a movie database. We've been trying to get them to stop putting people's ages up there. It's not necessary. But they won't stop because it's public domain. Well, it's not fair to actors to put their, their ages anywhere because what happens is when that actor uh, is, is, say, this actor is being considered for a part and they look at the age, they say this, they, they, can't, they can't discern anything about the actor's age or how they're going to look unless they see them. So what happens is because they see the age and the character they got in mind maybe is, 58 and the and the actor is 68 then they go oh the actor is too old not having even seen the actor that's not fair to the acting profession I agree you see what I'm saying yeah that's not I agree. fair they should be able to see the person and then decide then say oh wait a minute this, this actor is too old for that or they can look at the damn that he doesn't look that age but yeah he could play that so uh, you know the the, the SAG after union is trying to uh, fight this thing because it really is damaging. The age thing should be the viewer should say, "Hey, that person looks like they're so and so and so," and leave it at that, rather than, "Well, that actor looks so and so and so, but that actor is, you know, 106." I mean, how's he doing? That shouldn't be. That shouldn't even be in their heads. It should be like, what does that person look like on the screen? And that's all. So I'm one of those people who's saying, yeah, I agree with that. And I wish that IMDb would take those ages down because it's not fair to the actors. And I'm not just talking about me being an older person. Even a person who looks, you know, 25 and is 19 is not fair. Even a person that looks looks 19 but is 25 is not fair. It, it doesn't, you know what I'm saying? What it does, it limits. Because when I was, I was, um, I was, I was, I believe I was 26 years old. I did a, a, a guest shot on a television show at that time called Bonanza. Okay. And I was playing a 16 year old. So Michael Landon, who was the director and uh, had, a, had a huge influence on everything that that show did saw me in person and he said to me uh, in person he said yeah this, this kid's 16 years old and I said yeah he said you look 16 I said really he said yeah you look 16 I said well then wow let's do this he had no clue you know what, what age I was I wouldn't have if he if we had IMDB at that time he wouldn't even consider me because he would have been looking at my 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 
average, my normal age, 26, and well, this guy can't play his body too old. So it's not fair to the acting profession for this thing with age. Not fair. There are younger actors who play older people. There are older people who play younger people. Acting is acting. It ain't about well, how old they are. So, you know, this is what we have to, have to deal with now. It's not right. It's kind of like um, Sissy Spacek at 27 pulled off a brilliant performance as Carrie White and Carrie. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, it was all in how she dressed and, and presented herself. Absolutely. And she's still brilliant. She's yep. a brilliant, brilliant artist. Yep. She's basic. You know, we don't see enough of her. No, we don't. You're right. We don't see enough of her. And she's an Oscar yeah. winner. Oh, my God. Did you see her in uh, uh, this thing where she played Loretta Lynn? What was the name of that thing? Coal Miner's Daughter. Coal Miner? Did you see her in yes, that? Yes, I did. You're right, I oh. did. Oh, my God. I'm watching her, and I'm going, holy shit. Man, she's tearing this thing up. And Loretta Lynn uh, was a very high praise to her too, because she oh, did yeah, this thing and everything. There you go. There you yeah. go. And I don't think I don't think she was old enough to play Loretta, but damn, she killed it. She killed it. Absolutely killed it. You mentioned television. Do you have any any favorite t- television shows that you were that you've been in that stuff that just stands out that you loved being part of? Well, I loved being part of Ally McBeal. Ah, okay. Yeah, I love being part of that because it was uh, revolutionary in terms of television. Uh, uh, David Kelly wanted to, he always pushed the envelope. Uh, and he wanted to say something about uh, the life of lawyers, of young lawyers in reality. What, what, what are these people like? And he wanted to add a sprinkle of humor in there. Now, you may not have seen that show. But I thought that show was exemplary in terms of how it. I played, um, I played. He, he likes it, like I said, push the envelope. I played a minister on that show who was having affairs with his choir members. Now, most people don't want to put something up there like that because the Christian community get a little bit upset about stuff like that. Yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> He said, no, I want this. I want this. This is what I'm trying to do. And I did it, and I just enjoyed it, and I enjoyed Calista Flockhart. I enjoyed all the people that were in that show. I enjoyed the, the concept of the show, everything about it. Uh, even today, I could watch that show and still enjoy it. That's one of the shows I, I enjoyed doing more. I enjoyed doing Jack, uh, 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 you know, playing that part. Um, let see, what else did I do? I did a thing called... Uh, Quantum Leap that I enjoyed because oh, I got yeah. well, nominated for that one. Um, and then, uh, uh, I mean, I, I did a whole lot of television stuff. Sometimes there's so many of them that I can't even remember them. Oh, I remember Quantum Leap. Yep, Scott Bakula, Dean Stockwell, yep. Yep, 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 yep. Go all the way back there. I enjoyed that piece. And everything that I've done, uh, I pretty much enjoyed most of the time. You know, it's funny you mentioned the Christian community because I come from a Christian background and uh, I was baptized. And but you know what? And I and I've heard um, uh, Christians in the media complain about uh, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. And I'm sorry, I love the film. I mean, I'm a yeah. Christian. I love the film. But I yeah. look at some of these faith-based movies like Fireproof coming out. They have no creativity to them in the way they're yeah. shot. They're bland. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I heard somebody from Movie Guide, which is a, it's a group of uh, critics I can't stand, but they, they relayed this attack on... Um, somebody made some comment about Roger Ebert and, and how, how it was a shame that he wrote this or blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, but it's creative. Like, I wish I had that kind of creative mind to make yeah. something. But if these people are complaining so much... Well, rather than make junk like Fireproof, why not take one of these Christian screenplays and make something creative that has some of these interesting, innovative elements beyond the Valley of the Dolls had? And I'm not talking nudity, but I'm talking the way they shoot it uh, yeah. and all yeah. that. It just bugs yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. I think I think what happens is here's my take on it. I think what happens is, um, you know, you know, people in life. They have private lives, and they have public lives. Yep. And everybody's trying to protect 
people's public life uh, uh, and not really knowing what their private life is really like. People, and then you discover that these people that are complaining have a private life that you never even thought about. They're completely opposite of all the garbage that they're always spouting. Yep. You find out, so what? You mean you would do, what? You know, let's go with, with these televangelists. How many times have they, these people got caught doing something that you said, wait a minute, you're telling me to behave in a certain way and you're doing the same. Exactly. I mean, come on, man, get get a get a life. I mean, I mean, come on, don't don't be yelling at me to to, to straighten up and fly right because the, the whole thing is it's a it's a whole kind of hypocrisy. And it's, it, if it, if you don't want people to do a certain thing, or so you want people to do a certain thing, how about jumping out there and set the example? Don't be going in private and having orgies and then come out in public and say. You know, this orgy thing, we got to stop this. No, don't do that. Don't do that. And I'm just using an example. Yep. Don't, 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 do, don't be like that because when we discover that, we go, well, well, okay, now what do we do? You know, you, you got leaders are supposed to set examples. Yep. They're not supposed to be lunatics. They're supposed to set examples for the rest of the world. That's why they're leaders. If you, if you can't do that, then you shouldn't be in a leadership position. Period. Agreed. Agreed. Get away from it and go. Okay, I'm going to live my life in private, and I'm not going to do that. So there's this hypocrisy, and it's and it's too damn bad because, first of all, movies are just movies. They're not supposed to be real. They're supposed to be, you know, a slice of life, but they're films, and what's happening on the screen is not necessarily happening. You know, it may be, but not necessarily. And the thing to do is to be able to watch a film. You know, and enjoy it. One of my favorite films of all time is, is On the Waterfront. The reason why... Oh, great movie, great movie. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. The reason why uh, uh, it, it, it talks about something, it says something about unions and, and dock work, and it says something about crime in, 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 you know, in, in politics, it says a lot of stuff in there. And most of, mostly I love it because I love the man who played the part. I always have and always will because I always... What I always attach myself to when I watch him is not so much of the macho stuff like we were talking about, about Van Damme. It's the, and by the way, he is capable of sensitivity. I don't know whether you know it or not, but he is. Um, uh, but, but Brando always brings to the screen this kind of androgynous thing where he's not, he's not he, we can see the guy. We can see that he's, he's tough. We can see if you watch the film. We can see he was a tough prize fighter. You know, he talks like this, and you know, it's uh, you know. But but he he he's got this androgynous thing where everybody who watches him, man or or woman, loves what he's doing. And it, on the waterfront, it was it was right there in front of us. All of that was there. I mean, he he his his his, his, his vulnerability was there. You know, his his power was there. Uh, you know, his point of view about life was there, and everything was there. I mean, what a film that is um, in every respect. Yeah, wow. Yeah, even his introductory in um, Apocalypse Now, that's yeah. so great, the shadows over his face. You just see the hand trickle, uh, the, the water over the, the, the bald head. That yeah. in, before they slowly reveal him, Brando was just a captivating uh, presence. Oh, 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 God. I mean, come on, stop. I mean, <laughs> this man was something else. You know, he was something else. And I don't think th that I have seen anybody that creates uh, the way he does with such, uh, you know, I don't know if you like uh, motifs and, 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 and uh, you know, um, because I, I don't particularly like uh, things to be so so obvious. I don't I don't care for that obvious stuff. Sure. You know, like uh, uh, metaphors. I love metaphors. Oh, I agree. But, yep. But, yeah. And, yep. And also enjoy, you know, seeing a scene where you know two people are trying to say they love each other, but the filmmaker is so good that he has them not say I love you and just 
do and say all the awkward things that we do. I want to watch that forever because all of us are like that. Yep. How do I how do I make this person know that I love them, but I'm tripping over myself and I'm I don't know how to say it, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to bring, give her an apple, you know. Or I'm, I'm going to here's an apple. Or here's some flour, you know. Here's some flowers for you. Uh, um, uh, you know, that's basically all, all I can do right now. I can't say anything else because I, I just I can't say I love you. It's hard. I agree. Back or back away from it because oh, I'm afraid to say it. And all these things are so interesting. In, in my opinion. They're a hell of a lot more interesting than blowing up buildings. Yes. You, you know what I'm saying? And that's yep. like what you say about about martial arts. It's like, uh, come on, you know, what's what's you know what does that got to do with anything? So I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying about that. Uh, but me, I'm like you were talking about. I'm like that. I want to, I want to create something. The creative process, the thing that, like you were talking about, Russ Meyer. He did some creative stuff with that. Oh stuff. yeah, he did. Yeah. So yeah. there you go. We we actually when I, I back um, I'd say it was back in the year two thousand or whatnot I took a, a history of film class um, to to improve because I I review movies and one of the movies that we watched in that class was On the Waterfront. Mm-hmm. Great movie, yeah. Oh oh, fabulous film, fabulous film. Everything about it. There's, there's a scene, there's a scene in the park where he's he's uh, he's courting even Marie Saint. Yep, and 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 he she and he doesn't know whether she remembers him, and he says, you know, you know, you don't remember me, do you? And 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 she and she looks at him. She says, I, you, Terry Malloy, I remember you. And they start talking, and they're walking in the park, and there's a swing. I know you saw the film, so you know that. Yep, you I know, do. Kids, yep, kids swing right there, so it has to be the park. And <clears throat> he says, and she then drops. Her glove. She I know the scene. Glove. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Her, yeah. You know that piece? Yep. She drops the I don't know whether they rehearsed that or not, but it didn't look rehearsed to me. And and it's, she drops the glove, and she goes for it, and he picks it up. And I mean, come on, man, that can't be written. So and then not only did he pick it up, he's putting it on his on his hand, and she kind of goes to reach for it and and, re, and retreats, and, and as he puts. As he puts on the glove, but she keeps talking. She keeps telling the story. Usually, you know, when it's rehearsed, then they stop and they go the whole thing with the glove and the boom. It just went right by and just kept going. And finally, he gives her the glove back. He couldn't say, hey, baby, let's you and I get started with something here. He puts on the glove. And not only put it on, but he fingers it and messes with it. And does that, to me... I could watch that forever because I know what that scene was about. So how, how, how many times do you get to see anything like that anymore? Everything's straight out and open. And like you said, it's not, not that interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But, and so that, I, I really hope that your movie gets made. I, I wish you the very best of Thank luck you. with Thank that. You. Yeah, I do. And definitely if uh, you get that thing, uh, made and produced you know yeah. you gotta come on here and promote that oh i will i will do it Absolutely. yeah i do hope i can get other people from beyond the valley of the dolls on here i'm going to keep trying i'll certainly okay. let them know that you braved the waters and came on here and and you're not yeah. scared <laughs> yeah there you go there you go there you go i hope so too I hope so. you know maybe maybe when you speak to some of these people you like you said you say well harrison did it why, why can't you so, yeah, you know, I, I wasn't like Inglehart. I didn't beat you up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was going to say, though, um, you you got anything else you want to promote before we send you off? No, no, just what I wrote. And just, to, you know, that I've got this piece that, I'm, that i that got to cast and i got to produce. And uh, I, I think it's a story that should be told. Um, and I'm going to keep at it until it's done. Are you going to direct it? it? It it may turn out that way. I'm not sure. Uh, it, it may it may turn out that way. I'm a good director. So I don't know. I don't know. It may, it may be somebody else. I'm not sure yet. Oh wow! Do you have any directors that you model yourself after? Like any of them? Oh, I, oh I wouldn't. I wouldn't say I did, I model myself after any director. I just like I'm a 
an, a member of the act studio. Yep. And so I tend to like directors who direct like Ely Kazan. Okay, I, yep. I, I, I tend to want to see the development of the character and the story together, and I want to see those nuances, and I want to see how people actually communicate as opposed to some superficial story thing about right away they're going to kiss and right away you know they, they develop this relationship and we're going to go on now and they're happily ever, ever after i say crap on that because that's not true so i, I want I, I would be the kind of director that i would the closest to would be kazan because of how he likes to tell a story absolutely well you know what I, I'm really honored that you came on the show today. I, I know I reached out to you, I think it was November, and I and uh, and uh, I don't know what to happen with our schedules or whatnot, but I'm really glad that we were able to connect. And okay. uh, it was such an honor to have you on here. I was just wondering, before you go, would you mind very much doing a plug for my show? Okay, I'll be glad to, man. Since you you got me, I got you, so I'll help you. Absolutely. Yeah, just just state your name. My and my name is Greg Gilbert, and uh, yeah. my show is called Python's Paradise. Okay. All right. And um and from New Brunswick, Canada. Okay. Hey. Yeah. I'll be glad to do it, man. I'm gonna do it right now. Sure. Okay. So I'm talking to Greg Gilbert, right? Yep. Uh, in, from New Brunswick, Canada, and your show is called what? Python's Paradise. Oh, Pyth and the show is called Python's Paradise, and I'm on the air with him. And hey, everybody, you got to do this show. You got to see it. You got to hear it because it's great. Just curious, have you ever been up this way before? A couple of times. Not, not, not up. You're, you're north, right? You're north Canada. Yeah, actually, East Canada. I'm way, way, way up. Um, uh, we're probably neighbors with Nova Scotia. Oh, okay, yeah, you're up there. I've been to I've been to uh, uh, Toronto. I've been to Calgary. Mm -hmm. I've been to uh, uh, out here uh, on the west. You've got the uh, what do you call it across from from uh, Washington. Um, what is the area there? I can't remember all of a sudden. Um, what is what is that area uh, of Canada? They're just just up the road from uh, the state of Washington uh, in in in. in uh, I'm drawing a blank because I don't know oh, the map oh, that okay. well. <laughs> yeah, I. Oh, people are gonna be people are gonna be pissed off at me if I don't remember that name. You gotta remember name, that name. For Toronto, me. Ontario. Uh, I don't know. I I I could be way off. I barely know where we are on a map. <laughs> so, oh oh oh. Okay okay okay. All well. I know is we got lots of snow and ice, and I imagine you probably have some beautiful weather there in California. Uh, yeah, I'm in the uh, I'm in up in the mountains part of, of Southern California. We've got sunshine, but we've got cold weather, uh, so um, it's not warm here. But it's it's uh, it, it definitely is nice, you know. Uh, Probably a lot warmer where you are than where we are. I'll I'm sure. You. I'm sure. Nothing is. I'm sure. You're near Nova Scotia. I'm sure you're getting below zero there. Yeah, we're just a. I think we got a little about plus one today. I think. Oh my God! Okay, we, <laughs> we're lucky no, to we get. We, we we rarely ever get down to that level. <laughs> <laughs> we, I, we, rarely ever do we get down that slow. We, we in our mountains, it, it, you know, most of the time they have to make snow, so uh, you don't you don't have to do that. Right. Well, he, well, here in New Brunswick, Canada, we're happy to give you guys snow. <laughs> we got lots of it. Oh, until it gets cleared up in April or May, you know. <laughs> give us that sunny weather. Well, Harrison Page, thank you so much for coming on and doing my show. It is such an honor. And, and talking about Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, celebrating its creative. i got to see Vixen. And, yeah, I'll check out Lionheart. I'll do that. Yeah, be sure and do that, man. You know, it'll you'll be very, very surprised. Sure, we could, we could do that absolutely. And sometime in the future, love to have you back on. And I will send you an address, and uh, um, when I email you next, uh, when I'm home and within the next day or whatever. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, God bless God. you, Harrison. Okay. All right. Thank you. God bless you. Take care, man. You too. Yep. Yeah, bye bye.